Glad to have everyone join us tonight. Ain't no one online sharing their camera. Means y'all got to see my ugly mug. I could. I need to set a camera so that y'all can be seen. That's what I need. Turn. Well, I guess I can see the back of your head. Ah, well. How's everyone doing today? Super good. Good. Well, for those of you who are at home, since you're on a computer, um, I would encourage you to um, probably in the next few moments or whatever to Google. Um, I guess you'd probably call it interpretation um, schemes, S-C-H-E-M-E-S of Revelation. You'll probably see four different categories, futuristic, historical, preterist, and idealist or symbolic. Um, those, are, those will be the area that we're going to wrap up with tonight. I have a copy out of a commentary that um, I'm using as a reference in this class. And uh, that's available here. I didn't get it scanned until just a little while ago, so... Uh, that's why it's not out, at least for general public, to have, but we sure do appreciate whatever we can do to, to help out. Um, before we begin, are there any prayer requests we need to be mindful of tonight? Okay. Okay. He has to show signs of improvement, probably. So, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if for those online, if you could hear or couldn't hear, but uh, Betty mentions the prayer request for Kermit. He is in rehab, um, but has about a week left before he's he's got to show signs of improvement within the next week, but. He is doing remarkably well from what he was two weeks ago. Um, so he's doing remarkably better. And so we're thankful for that, but prayers for continued. Because my understanding is if he shows signs of improvement, he can stay there. But I, I don't know what they judge for signs of improvement. He's got to be able to stand up and walk. Stand up and walk. Okay. So for Kermit. Anyone else? Angela? How's she? Now, is she, she's still at your house right now. Okay. Okay. So Angela is home. She's doing well, but she gets her staples out a week from Friday. And for those of you who are online, I, we're, we've got the microphones on in here, but I don't know how well they pick up. So feel free to let me know what you can and can't hear. And uh, I will, we're, we're going to try, I think next week, we're looking at even doing two more microphones that may hang a little low, closer back here. But we're all, we're all just trying to figure out how to make all this work, so... Champion. Okay. So it was your Rick's cousin had a death in the family, the champion family. So prayers for the champion family. Okay. Anyone online that we have prayer requests for that we need to be mindful of? Well, if not, let's have a moment of prayer, shall we? Father, we come before you tonight as humble as we know how to as humans. 
approaching your throne as you are our God, our King, our Sovereign. And we know that we're not worthy to be, to be here. We're not worthy to come before you both in spirit nor in prayer. That it's only by your goodness and your glory and your grace that we are privileged to speak to you. Father, as we come before you, we confess to you our wrongs. God, each one of us are human, and to be human is to err. We're going to make mistakes, and you know that. And even, even in your knowing of that, you still love us and care for us, provide for us, and protect us. But God, in our wrong, we confess to you the wrong. And whatever may be hidden within us, Father, if there's something deep, help us to uh, may your spirit bring it out. May your spirit make it known. And may we, may we truly share that to you. Father, we're thankful for the blessing of your son, Jesus. The Christ who became our brother, who sacrificed himself for us, one, because He wanted to, and two, because You love us. Help us to be the people who are always thankful for the gifts that You've given. And Father, we come before You tonight with many on our hearts. God, there are some that, that we may not have, even, have mentioned tonight, some that we um, either forgot uh, just in a moment, or some that we have um, the some that maybe we just don't feel comfortable saying out loud. But Father, <clears throat> we think of her, we think of Kermit, and we think of the Champion family. As each one of them are dealing with the struggles that, uh, in their own circumstance, whether it is, is health, um, whether it is um, the passing or the death of a loved one, or whether it's recovery. Father, for each of these things, we, we beg of your care. We beg of your attention. But Father, help us to relinquish those to you, to trust you with them, that we may live a life in peace, walking with you, knowing that you care about each one of these people more than we could ever imagine. And Father, my last request is that you be with us. Father, I feel woefully inadequate to lead these people in the book of Revelation. And I know that each one of us struggle with this good book. It may not be a deep struggle, but it's a struggle to understand to it's a struggle to to know what is intended and how it should change our lives so father my my request our request is that tonight as we begin this study that you would give us the wisdom that you would give us the insight and that you would show us exactly what you want us to see and may this book come alive. May the imagery that is said, the images that we can see, may we, may we see the meaning that John wanted to share. And may in some way it change who we are. That's our prayer for any text. But let it be our prayer for this. This we pray through your blessed Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I mean, you're on video. Did you know that? Vicki, you came on and joined us. Oh, never mind. I tell you what, Vicki, I got real excited when I saw you. Come on in, have a seat. If you, uh, as I was 
if you didn't grab a handout, you may want to grab a handout. For those of you who are online and joining us, um, I, I would encourage you to pull up Google and look up interpretation or interpretive schemes. So it's interpretation, S-C-H-E-M-E-S. Uh, that's at least the way this particular commentary lists it. Um, there's going to be four primary schemes for the book of Revelation that we'll spend a little bit of time discussing tonight. Um, as we begin, I, I will go ahead and confess. Uh, Betty comes in bringing this beautiful notebook that you said is from Romy. When did he teach Revelation? So at least five years ago. Brings in this beautiful notebook full of of wisdom. So I'm, now I'm real nervous because all I got is three little measly pages. But but that's okay. We're gonna have a good time with it, and uh, we're gonna we'll get into it. And I've got Greg here, who is our resident expert in in all things. Bible, so I, I know that it, what my inadequacies, together as a community of people, we will find something to we'll find something to converse about and to grow spiritually. Um, I, I will go ahead and tell you some as as far as introduction. My, Mike had sent me, and Mike, if you can find it and want to read it, I would love to hear it again. I looked for through my text messages. Mike sent me a link or a picture. Um, from a friend of his, uh, that they have just studied Revelation, and he wrote this, it was probably no more than three sentences long, a synopsis of the book that I thought was wonderful, and then lo and behold, I can't find it when I want it. Uh, but I, I want to give a few synopsis that I've come across that I thought were, were really worth sharing so that we can start, our, start on the right foot in this conversation um, the first one I want to share is one that says, God wins. That's the message of Revelation. Uh, Revelation tells how the sovereign ruler of the universe destroys evil, rescues believers, transforms creation, and lives among his people forever. So when we come to this book, as ignorant as we may be of it, or as scared as we may be of it, I think there are some very simple themes that if we try to keep the simple themes in mind, can take away the scariness. Um, another one, Revelation comforts and assures the faithful who are suffering but sternly warns those who are com compromising with the world system. Um, and that was kind of what, like the one that uh, Mike sent me. And if I find it, and my, or if, if Mike finds it or if, or if I come across it, then I'll bring it up at a future class session. Um, tonight, I want, if we make it into the book, we will have covered a lot of ground. I want to cover just some introductory facts. My goal for tonight is uh, if, we, if we get to chapter one, we'll cover just one, two, and three. Um, actually, my, my real goal is that we will cover that next week, that we'll start in verses one through eight next week. But in tonight's discussion, I want us to start off with a couple of the core questions that I like to answer about any book in the opening studies. Uh, the first one is authorship. Um, I think it's important to know who wrote the book, because once we know who wrote the book, we can at least have a little bit more of an understanding of the circumstances involved in their writing of the book. Um, so the first one being, who wrote the book? Does anyone know who wrote the book of Revelation? John wrote the book of Revelation. If you were, if you were stuck or struggling with that, look at verse 1. I, like I said, I don't necessarily want to get into verse 1, but look at the ending of verse 1. By sending his angel to his servant, John. <laughs> Greg brings up a great question. Which John are we talking about? The New Testament has, what, four Johns um, that, are, that are recorded? One of them is a very, um, I hate to say mediocre, because you never want to recall anyone in the Bible mediocre. You got one John who's really not listed a lot. You've got John the Apostle, John the Elder, and then John. What's the other John? John Mark? Okay. I don't know. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Which John, though? Um, and so when we talk about the idea of, of authorship, which John? I'm going to enter it from the, the supposition. I'm assuming, there we go. I'm assuming 
that it is John, the disciple of Jesus, um, the son of Zebedee, who was an apostle. I, I come at it from that approach. Um, let's see. He's the same as the one who authored the gospel and then later the epistles, one, two, and three. Um, most of the early church um, historians believe this. Um, there's a guy named Irenaeus who you've probably heard of, at least in some of our intertestamental studies. Um, Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of, of John. And so you have Irenaeus who lived around, the, I think he wrote this around the 150s. Um, so if you're assuming that the book of Revelation was written sometime at the latter half of the first century, um, then you're, you're dealing with a guy who's now 70 years removed from the writing of the book, um, which isn't that long in the grand scheme of things. And he attributes it uh, to John the Apostle, uh, John the son of Zebedee, John the disciple of Jesus. Um, John was an authoritative figure and Christian leader in Asia, and we can kind of see some of this um, in the book of Revelation whenever we are talking about uh, the letters to what churches, what seven letters to what, or what letters to seven churches are we talking about? The seven churches of Asia Minor. And so for the author of Revelation to write a personal account to churches, we would believe that he would have some sort of close connection. John, the disciple, the apostle, was um, after Nero's time period moved into Asia, which would be modern-day Turkey area, uh, or at least that would be the region that we're discussing, um, and became a prominent figure in the Asian churches. Um, there was, or there is a lot of questioning on who actually wrote the book, though. Um, it seems, I always find this interesting, it seems that the more modern the commentator is, the more questions there are to who actually wrote the book. In, oh. Oh, Mike found it. Thanks, Mike. Did you text it? No, that's not you texting. This is, this is the, uh, the quote. Thank you, Mike, for finding it. This is the quote that Mike uh, shares. Um, oh, this is... Oh. This is actually from a book, The Evolution of the Word by Marcus Borg, page 390-369. Borg is a really respected author. What is a faithful interpretation of Revelation in our time? Is it one that affirms that what, is, what it says will still happen? That there will be a future beast who in a final battle at Armageddon will be vanquished by Jesus at the head of an army of heaven? that the plagues and wars and earthquakes and other signs of the end are still going to occur as signs of the second coming? Or is it one that takes seriously what John was saying to Christians in his time, that accommodation to imperial ways is wrong, that the struggle between the lordship of Christ and the lordship of Caesar is the great conflict, that it is important to preserve, even to persevere, sorry, even when it looks like the beast is winning, that appearances to the contrary, the beast does not have the final word and is not the final word. In its first century context, Revelation is a pervasively anti-imperial document. What might this mean for Christians today, especially American Christians in a time of the American empire? Was the problem with the Roman empire or was it, with, or was it Roman? Or was the problem that it was an empire? Note that a historical and contextual approach to Revelation does not restrict its meaning to the past. It begins with its past meaning, but, it, uh, but is not confined to that. It asks, if, if this is what Revelation meant then, what might it mean now? Thank you, Mike, for finding that and shooting it over to Greg. Um, when we come to author, back to authorship, though, we come to some ideas of who wrote it. Um, Dionysius, who was Bishop of Alexandria and about, I think he lived in about the 300s, he questioned, he was the first real popular one to say, I don't think John wrote Revelation. He says, I don't think John wrote Revelation because the Greek in, Re in Rome, the Greek in Revelation is a very, um, 
it's a very rough Greek. Um, it's not smooth, and, uh, and it's not like the Greek in the Gospel by John or in the Epistles to John, by John. Um, so he really questioned some of that. Um, later on, you come to a guy named Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther did not have much to any respect for the book of Revelation. And I think that my opinion, I think you have people like that who through the years start kind of belittling the book. And then you come 2,000 years later, and here we are thinking, oh, my word, I can't understand this thing. I kind of question if, if those men had been more diligent in their studies on Revelation, would we be sitting here today afraid of the book? with the book. Yeah. And, and I think it's the problems like that. For those of you online, Greg made the comment that there, there was a row in the Stone Campbell movement, which Churches of Christ are a part of, um, who had problems with the book. And so when we start having people who are respected having problems with a book, we stop studying it. Uh, I think the, the, the concern I would have for today is if you can, you can find modern Bibles where they've begun to erase parts of the Bible, where they've begun to take out parts of the Bible. And now the, the big movement today is we only cover the red letters. If Jesus said it, then it's important. But if Jesus didn't say it, then it's not important. There's actually, Miss Betty's looking at me like, like this is just... That's who, is that who did the numbering system? Uh, One through seven or something? Basically, basically, they categorized the verses as far as how close the verse was to what Jesus said. And it was an opinion, but it was like, well, we think Jesus actually said this, or it's Jesus didn't say it. You have a modern idea where people are saying that Paul was not an inspired author. And so if Paul wrote any book, they want to take Paul's writings out. I mention that not as a part of Revelation, but as a part to realize that we have this, this we're con, there's a confusion on Revelation within us and within our greater church community. And I'm assuming that that comes because, I, I can't tell, uh, Irenaeus, I don't think he was confused on Revelation. If his, if his mentor Polycarp sat at the feet of John, I don't think he was confused on Revelation. But when you go forward 300, 200 years, 300 years, and you've got a guy who all of a sudden says, we don't need to study the book. You go forward 600 years, another guy, you come forward to 17, 18, 1900, and you have a guy that says, we don't need to study the book. Then I can sit here in 2020, and I can understand there's people who are going to say, we don't need to study any of this unless they're the red letter words. So, now that we've gone down that rabbit hole and brought everyone to depression, um, let's talk about dating of the book. Uh, we need to know a time, for, a time frame, and the reason time frame is important is there are two primary dates. The first date is that it was written in either 69 AD. That's the early date. The late date is that it was written 95, 96 AD. Um, the reason that's important is if the book was written in the early time period, the 69 AD time frame, then a lot of our references are probably about Nero, who was emperor of Rome. Um, the reason that that makes a lot of sense is if you go to chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, you have this, uh, the, the uh, rambling through the temple uh, by Gentiles. Um, that could be pr uh, prefacing the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Um, in chapter 13, verse 18, you have the reference to the beast, uh, the number 666, the reference to the beast. Um, that could be uh, deciphered down as the numerical form for the name Nero. 
Uh, we could also go forward a little bit more into chapter 17, verses 10 and 11, and we see this uh, seven-headed beast, which could be a reference to Emperor Galba, um, who was later ascribed as, oh, I had a typo, who who is, who he is. I, I forgot what that is, but, um, huh? Well, that I come up with in the later on 95 and 96. Uh, so if you, that's the, that's the idea for the early dating. If you go with the late dating, the evidence that points to a late dating, that means that it's writing about the emperor Domitian, um, who would have ruled at that time period. Um, Irenaeus, who yet again, disciple of Polycarp, disciple of John, he believed in a late date. Um, he basically gave us almost a, a time frame that this was in the reign of Domitian. Um, but we see that he, is that in this part of my notes? Oh, I do get to that here, Greg. Um, near our, Domitian was the first emperor who claimed the title, Our Lord and God. He was, um, and in part of that, what Greg had mentioned is this idea of Nero Redivitus, which I think would be Latin, but I don't know. It stands for Nero, the resurrected one. Um, the idea was that Nero would come back and would reign in Rome after his death. And Domitian really claimed a lot of that title and that character. So when Domitian came in, he really took what Nero had started, threw it on steroids, and that's how we kind of come to some of the persecution that we see in the church. Any questions on the timing or the date? I know y'all are probably like, we don't care what time it was written, as long as it was written. Yes. If you play Rick toward Negro, then you're probably going to be talking about Paul. If you do Domitian, maybe you're talking about Paul Rome. And then if you apply it all in the future, then you're talking about something else. See, Greg, this this is I just need to get you a microphone. The the, the dating is important because if you put it at an early date, and for those of you online. Could you online here? No. Okay, Larry. Thank you, sir. Um, for for the, if we apply it to an early date, then what we what we do is we see a lot of the imagery is the destruction of Jerusalem. If we put it as a late date, um, then we see it maybe as the destruction of the Roman Empire. Um, so really, how we date the book does matter. Um, I think in either of those dates, you can claim either one of them. I personally sit on the late date. And I'll, I'll give you the reason why. And I, I agree. Oh, thanks, Larry. Uh, you know, I, I sound like, and the reason being, um, I, I was taught that if the closer you are to the source, the more authoritative you are. If... Um, if I had a question about Miss Betty's life, I'm going to trust her son to tell me about it. Why would I trust your son, Miss Betty? If he lived in your house for 18 years, he probably knows everything there is to know about you. I would trust that more than I would trust Laura Jump's account of Betty. No offense, Laura is going to know Betty, but I'm going to trust that because there's a different level of knowledge. If Polycarp, in my opinion, who is far closer to John the Revelator than anybody else so far, can say this was the time period, and it was written in in the words of in the words of Irenaeus, for it was seen not long ago, but almost in our generation, near the end of Domitian's reign. If that's his comment. I'm going to sit that that's probably the dating. Okay. Historical situation. What's going on at this time period? Well, when we're looking at this time period, Christians are facing, are facing pressure and persecution. 
Uh, temptation is to compromise the faith. Uh, opposition first began uh, among the Jewish synagogue. That's in chapter 2, verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9. Uh, Judaism was an approved religion under Rome, so they kind of had some wiggle room in the way they did things. They didn't have to, they didn't have to worship the Roman gods. Um, however, the Jews didn't like the Christians riding on their coattails, and so Rome finally caught wind of this and uh, then started oppression towards the Christians. Then you have under the time of Domitian, which is yet again some other reasoning I like, I, I think, for the later dating. Um, Domitian and the imperial cult um, is the language you'll see in studies. It's basically the imperial worship, the idea that the emperor was God uh, and the people who would buy into that. If you did not believe that the emperor was God, you all of a sudden were ostracized. You could not buy and sell in the same marketplace. Um, there would be additional persecution towards you because of your beliefs. And so when we kind of take this historical situation, we see the persecution um, that was facing the Christians. And again, during the time of Domitian was the time that um, Christians were used to light the roads towards Rome. Um, so there was extreme persecution. Um, don't let anyone lie to you. It was not an easy time period for a Christian. And so a lot of Christians would say, look, can we, can we wiggle some? Do we have to stay faithful? Can we appear publicly one way, but yet privately do another? And I'm approaching Revelation with the idea that John's saying no. In spite of whatever the empire's doing, in spite of whatever anyone else is doing, faithful to the point of death. Overall purpose, the question that I think is most answered in Revelation, if I were to put one question to it, who is Lord of the universe? Um, I think that Revelation is writing from an anti-imperial standpoint. I think John is writing from that, which as the article or the, the thing that uh, Mike sent over to Greg, um, it, it makes it very applicable for us. The United States is a modern-day empire. And the stuff that I fear, this, I don't want to get too political, but the stuff that I fear we are seeing in our world today are the steps towards what Christians could have been seeing in the time of Rome. If that's the case, if my fear is correct, we are living in a time period where Revelation carries a very real weight for us, where it should be important for us to pay attention to and to be aware of our faithfulness to the Lord. Any thoughts or comments before we get to this last section, which is your little handout? Um, <clears throat> the genre, uh, as far as the, the way the book is written, uh, there is a greeting and a, an exhortation or a close, the beginning of the book, the very end of the book. Um, those probably are not apocalyptic literature. Um, why do I say that? Well, revelation of Jesus Christ, John is telling us in, in verse 1. And at the very end of the book, he tells us basically, anyone who adds to or takes away from this book, I don't necessarily think that's revelation or apocalyptic literature. We do have the letters to the seven churches. I kind of throw that maybe like an epistle. You got some little letters in here. Um, Revelation is really two primary genres, though. It is the genre of prophecy, which covers the idea of what is happening and what will happen in the future. And it is what's known as a, the apocalyptic literature. Um, apocalyptic means to unveil or to reveal. Um, so John is writing from this perspective of unveiling or, un, or revealing Something that is not seen, but should be seen. So what I think we're going to see in the imagery is stuff that I hope we can maybe find ourselves. Um, interpretations. This is the part that gets us. Your handout, and if you're online and you look up uh, the interpretation, probably say schemes, interpretation theories, 
for Revelation, you're going to come up with primarily four categories. Um, the four primary categories are preterist, historical or historist, uh, futurist, and idealists. Um, basically, the preterist um, is the idea that Revelation is directly for the first century Christian. It's encouraging them with a message of hope of how God plans to deliver them from the evils of the Roman Empire. In this idea, there is no future idea. There's no future Jesus is coming. It is entirely written to the first century. Okay? Historic, historic, historists. I guess that's how you'd say that. Um, Revelation offers, for them, Revelation offers a prophetic outline of church history from the first century until the future coming of Christ. That's why I kind of, that's my summation from it. Like I said, you're, if you want more information, and for those of you online, I'll try and scan this and get this sent out to you, but you can feel free to read this. A futurist's revelation is concerned with what will happen at the end of history just before the second coming of Christ. So for a futurist, it really had no implication for the immediate audience. It was more what's going to happen in the future. And the last one is an idealist or a symbolical. Revelation is a symbolic description of the ongoing battle between God, between God and evil. The book offers timeless spiritual truths to equip Christians for persevering in a world filled with suffering and injustice. So, giving yourself those four little categories, which one are you? Don't answer. <laughs> It's amazing how timeless the Bible can be, but uh, I, I'm excited to see how timeless this particular book can be uh, because uh, the, the stuff that I've, I've just started reading, I've got about five commentaries that I'm referencing for our study, and I don't know if any one of them has really got it right. Matter of fact, when I look at these four views, um, I kind of appreciate your handout because he gives mixed views and a postmodern approach, and then he says, my position. I don't know if I even agree with his direct position. Another commentator I read, he called it the eclectic view, which is really you take the best of all of these views and you try and put them together. I sit, the, pre, the preterist makes a lot of sense to me, in all honesty, because I look at the Bible as being written to the first century, or to whoever the initial audience was, Jeremiah was writing to his immediate audience, but it has an implication for me. Uh, Moses wrote the law for his immediate audience, but it has an implication. So to me, this preterist view makes a lot of sense. However, to say that it is purely and solely in the first century time period, what do you do with, was it chapters 20 and 22? Well, I guess I could say that that's possibly the church, but the church had already been there, so how is it coming from heaven? What, what do you do with those last chapters, uh, with this new Jerusalem? Then you have people who step in and say, well, there was Jesus already came at 70 AD and, and has gone on. And I, uh, What's that theory? Do you remember offhand? I guess it's a 70 AD theory, but, um, but yet again, each one of these interpretations to be sole and pure to it, in my opinion, seems like you miss something that the other one has that's good.
Mm. Which he, he was a historist, wasn't he? I th the handout tells you. I forget which one he was. But stuff like that, you know, and, and you're always having to change for them. And even the future has that problem. A lot of it comes out of the life that they had and the people were and the environment. I think that obviously affects the whole life. But then you come to some of the other For those of you online, Greg was saying that the historist is the one that is least liked for him. It's most problematic because what do you do when history, as history ages, which history are we talking about? Are we talking about the Roman Catholic Church? Are we talking about the empire of Rome? Are we talking about the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem? Um, which one are you going to follow there? The same true with the, with the futurist. If you're going to hold to that one, what the, how do you give proper interpretation to it? So that's where I kind of lend on the idea that in each of these sections as we go through it, I think we're going to have to take the time um, to really think about and not be sold all, all in to one interpretive theory. Yeah, I agree with that, Josh, but um, more leaning toward a partial preterism. Does that make sense? I like that term, Mike. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, yeah. that's it. Okay. Yeah, a partial, partial preterist view. I, I like that that terminology, Mike, and that's. I think that will be. From where I'm sitting today, that's going to probably be more of my approach. Um, that may change as uh, as Tim Isaac said. For those of you who can't, didn't hear him, um, ask me at the end of class, and we'll discuss it then. Any question? There is a ton of meaning, and and it now when I say a ton of meaning, meaning. I, I don't want us to read some of this stuff and say, oh, well, we're, we're looking forward to this beast coming up and doing all of this and this and this. I really don't think that's going to happen, personal opinion today. But it might. And there, there may, there, I don't know what the end of time is going to look like. I have it in my head that I'm going to go to sleep one day. I'm going to wake up in paradise. If someday God chooses to roll back the curtain so that we can see the spirit world, who knows what that looks like? Um, and I think that that's, I think that's what we see in John's account here is the Lord opened his eyes to see the spirit world, and that's what we're left with. Um, any last comments? We need to wrap it up on this end. Uh, for those of you online, I, I am going to work. Uh, I ran out of time this week. We're going to work to get some better microphones so that the crowd can be heard. Um, so please know, please hang with me on that. We are trying to figure something out there. I had someone unmute. If you've got a comment, please go ahead and make it. Well, there were times that we could hear Greg pretty clear. So so what you're doing is, is working. Well, hot dog. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for your attention. Um, we'll be looking forward to our study. Like I said, for next week, go ahead and read verses 1 through 8 at least. Um, we'll try and cover eight verses next week, and um, I'll be looking forward to our time together. I, I would encourage you on your reading, um, read chapter 1, maybe just for pure pleasure. Read it out loud. We may even read it out loud next week. Um, something that I'm... Um, I'm really looking at is, and it's highlighted, where's it at? It's in the first eight verses where it says, blessed is he who hears the words of this prophecy. Verse three, who read aloud the words of this prophecy, uh, and blessed are those who hear. So I'm, I'm, I'm contemplating 
the, that maybe we need to read it out loud and maybe we need to hear it. Okay. Okay, thank you all very much for joining tonight. We will look forward to next Wednesday. Uh, and y'all have a great night.